Welcome back, Bound for Oregon group. It's time for chapter 12. What's the matter with those men? Luvina whispered in my ear. Which men? I asked, looking around. I was finding so much to stare at inside the high walls of Fort Hall. There was the fort itself, built of sun-baked adobe, with a wide, square dirt yard in the middle. And the people, a few soldiers in uniform, some whiskery, rough-looking mountain men, Indians belonging to the Snake and Shoshone tribes, so we've been told, and small groups of travelers like ourselves, stopped to shoe horses and trade for food and supplies. But the thing I couldn't keep my eyes away from was the houses facing the square, solid walls and doors and windows, and inside most likely tables spread with cloths and cupboards filled with china dishes and real bedsteads. With a little twinge of pain, like a toothache that kept returning, I thought again of our house back in Arkansas. Mother's roses blooming next to the front door, a friendly curl of smoke rising from the chimney. That put me in, the meet, in mind of the meeting house and the schoolhouse and how much I had been missing my studies. I had a sudden sharp longing to forget about Oregon, wherever it was, and stay right here. Those men! Luvina nudged me, pointing and giggling. They look so funny! Two men in buckskin breeches were leading their horses toward the blacksmith. Though they were standing up, their breeches curved as if they were sitting down. It's not polite to point, Luvina, Father corrected her gent gently, but he too had to smile. It looks as if they were out in the damp and let their clothes dry while they were seated. We had come from camp a mile away to buy extra linchpins for the wagon, as well as crackers, sugar, and maybe a little fresh milk. Our cow, Lily, had died three days ago from eating a poison weed. Mother, who seemed always tired now, was resting back in camp with Cynthia. You girls stay close to me, father told us. Drinking in the rich smells of smoked meat, fish, tobacco, fur skins, the hot, red hot iron of the blacksmith's fire, Luvina and I trailed after father as he traded for things we needed. Afterward, my hands clutching a half full pail of milk, we waited while he talked with Captain Powell and some other men in the cool shadows of the yard. Their voices buzzed on. The sun began to sink in the sky and long shadows came creeping across the yard. I watched a small group of Indian women and children nearby. They were dressed in deer skin, decorated with red ribbons and porcupine quills and beads of many colors. And the women wear, wore shiny brass bracelets on their arms and rings around their fingers. The colors were bright against their dark brown skin and glossy black hair. They appeared friendly to me. Looking at a girl about my age, playing with a fat baby, I wished suddenly that we spoke the same language so that I could talk to her. It is settled then, I heard father say, shaking hands with a giant of a man who had a bushy graying beard. We pull out at first light tomorrow, replied the man in a deep voice. That is how we learned that we were leaving Captain Powell's wagon train to join a smaller one led by this man, Captain Clark. Why, I asked father on our way back to camp. I had felt so safe in Captain Powell's company, closed inside that big circle of wagons every night with so many uh, rifles to protect us. It is because of mother, father answered, not quite looking at me. You know, she has not been feeling very well. A smaller train can move faster and get us to Oregon sooner. Also, in a smaller train, if one of the families should have to stop, the rest will not go on without them. Something strange in his voice made me stop and take notice. 
What was the matter with mother? I wondered. Was she just tired from traveling? But or was she not just tired from traveling, but truly sick? And was father so concerned about her, he thought we might have to stop? Of course. The moment I saw her back in camp, rubbing her back as she straightened up from bending over the fire, I knew what it was. Mother was not sick. She was going to have a baby. Why hadn't I realized it weeks ago? I had seen other women with thickening waists, their faces pale, and their eyes weary from too many miles of jouncing in the wagons. And I had seen wagons suddenly halted along the trail so a baby could be born. Just a few nights ago, in fact, Mother and Mrs. Grant had gone to try to help a young woman in the Powell train who was having a difficult birth. I had heard them return very late and mother say to father in a hollow voice, she worked so hard that the baby was born dead. A new baby. The idea unfurled in my mind like an opening flower. We were going to have a brand new baby in our family. Maybe it would be a boy this time. Father would like that. He was always telling people jokingly that he was surrounded by females. Luvina didn't know about the baby yet, and neither, of course, did Cynthia. Only I did. It was a secret. I thought with a little rush of pleasure that I shared with mother. Then I remembered the young woman whose baby had been born dead. That couldn't happen to mother. This baby, our baby, was going to be born healthy and strong. I would make it so, I promised myself, by taking care of mother. I would do more of the chores at mealtime so she could rest and carry things so she wouldn't have to bend over. Smiling to myself, I went to lift the biscuit pan out of the fire. Just after dawn the next day, our wagon and the Grants fell in behind the eight others of the Clark train. And the bright walls of Fort Hall, like all the other landmarks and campsites that in my mind's eye stretched out in a line going east all the way to Independence, faded slowly to nothing in, in the distance. Though large and powerful like the mountains around us, Captain Clark was quiet and easy in his ways. His wife, cheerful and tiny with bird-like bones, talked more than he did. Traveling with them was his sister, Mrs. McReynolds, a widow who had lost her husband along the trail. In her eyes, I could see a, graze, a glaze of grief, but she traveled along steadily and quietly, seeming determined to finish the journey they had started together. And there were about five McReynolds and four Clark children who were in and out of each other's wagon so much that they all mixed together in my mind. Soon we came to the Snake River, a wandering greenish stream so deep and cut so deep into the rock in many places we could only look at it, not get down to drink from it. We were to follow this river for the next 300 miles. We passed the American Falls, a beautiful tumbling torrent of river of water 50 feet high, and a few miles farther, the, ra the Raft River. Here, the trail that led to California veered off to the left. The Ted Rose party was headed that way, the storekeeper at Fort Hall told me, father said. I thought of Sarah Jane trudging beside her wagon up that shallow valley toward a far off mountain peak. Our ways had parted once again. For, for several days after that, we traveled across desolate country. As my eyes could see nothing but hot yellow sand and gray sagebrush, I gathered up the dry brush for mother's fires, but it burned with a smell that was worse than buffalo chips. The sun scorched the top of our heads. Dust flew in clouds, sometimes from up on the spring seat, we could see neither father nor the team. At night, if we managed to find a camping place that had both water and a little grass, we were thankful. 
and if there were a few sticks of wood for a fire as well, we positively rejoiced. Our oxen were growing so thin that their bones stood out like sharp mountain ridges. Buck and Ben looked at father with reproachful eyes as he yoked them to the wagon each morning. Luvina and I felt so sorry for them that we tried to think of some way to help. One day, as the two of us were walking along next to the wagon, I spotted a little clump of green ahead. Look, Luvina, I said, pointing. Grass, she said joyfully. She raced ahead and began pulling it up in big bunches. I ran after her. When we had all we could carry, we walked back and held out handfuls of grass so Buck, for Buck and Ben. Go on, have some, answered Luvina. Oxen could not smile. It was silly to think they could, but there was something close to it in their mild, dark eyes as they chewed gratefully on that sweet, soft grass. For days after that, we gathered every little blade of grass we could find in our aprons and fed it to the oxen as we traveled along. Now illness came to our wagon again. It began with two of Mrs. McReynolds' children, 15-year-old Rebecca and 12-year-old George, who were stricken with mountain fever. They had aching muscles and rashes and high fevers. Soon some of the Clark children as well as others in the train also had the sickness. It struck suddenly and sometimes the, the fever rose so high that the victim would rave in delirium. Remembering Luvina's brush with death on the banks of the Platte, I felt a little pinch of fear. Would this sickness be as terrible as the cholera had been? But we could not stop moving. It was now the past the middle of August and the men were beginning to worry about being snowbound in the mountains that lay ahead. Mrs. McReynolds had all she could do taking care of her sick children. So everyone else tried to help her in any way they could. Jesse, who at 19 was the oldest of the Clark children and a thinner, darky, darker copy of his father, drove her wagon and John took care of the loose stock. As the country became rougher and rockier, more and more oxen were giving out. Foot sore, weary and weak with hunger, they would lie down and nothing could get them up again. They had to be left behind. We need to lighten the load for the animals we have left, Captain Clark told the company one evening. Four more oxen had been lost that day and the strain showed on his deeply lined face. I must ask each of you to remove as much weight as you possibly can from your wagons. Some cut down their wag wagon beds. Others took out camp stoves and rocking chairs, spinning wheels and chests and cooking pots. We left a trunk with most of mother's good china and her pretty hand woven, woven tablecloth sitting beside the trail. One man, Mr. Judson, set out a heavy rolling pin, then snatched it up again. Do I really need to throw this away? He asked father. I was amazed to see tears actually rolling down his cheeks. It was my mother's. I remember she always used it to roll out her biscuits. They were awful good biscuits. Father looked at him, a big stout man with a face like a little boy. Anything we can do without will make a difference, he said gently. So the rolling pin too was left behind. At a place called Salmon Falls, Captain Clark brought our wagon train to a halt again. A decision had to be made about which trail to follow. The main road went along the south side of the Snake River, but the grass there looked to be scarce. Captain Clark thought we might do better by crossing the other side. Some of the other men disagreed with him. I heard Father and Mr. Grant discussing it that evening. We should stick to the old road, Mr. Grant argued. It's bound to be faster. But so many to have traveled it before us. What if there's no grass? Oxen, um, questioned father. We can't afford to lose any more oxen. 
The men talked about it for hours. Finally, they took a vote. It turned out that everyone except Captain Clark and father favored following the old road. The other men felt so strongly about it that next morning they told Captain Clark they had decided to split from the train. Come with us, Mr. Grant urged father. Since his ex experience in the wilderness, his body seemed to have shrunk inside his frayed and faded clothes, but his eyes still flashed with feeling. You know how dangerous any delay is now. You cannot run the risk. He was talking about the mountain snows, but I thought of mother and the baby that would be soon born. Father hesitated. A struggle seemed to be going on somewhere behind his calm, clear eyes. We cannot leave the Clarks alone, he said finally. Not with all the sickness they've had. We must stay with them. So once again, we parted with old friends. Mr. Grant waved a smiling farewell, a trace of the old bounce in his steps as he hitched up his oxen. But mother's shoulders seemed to sag as she said goodbye to Mrs. Grant, pressing into her hand a gift of flower seeds from her garden. And it was strange to see John heading out to herd the cattle without David at his side. Though my eyes saw it, my mind couldn't quite accept that this was happening. We had been with the Grants so long. I had begun to think we would always be together, even in Oregon. Goodbye, our voices echoed in the thin morning air. And once again, I felt that empty, lonesome feeling as I watched the Grants wagon, its cover now a dull and dusty gray, roll slowly out of sight. After crossing the river, we found ourselves in a pretty grassy valley. It was like a wild meadow, only little hills babbled out of the rocky walls on the north side. Captain Clark stopped the wagons and he and father smiled at each other. All that day we rested, taking care of the sick children, enjoying the cool water and letting the animals graze on the good grass until they had their fill. Watching Buck and Ben, big clumps of green dripping from their mouths. I wished we could stay there a long time. But of course, the next day we had to move on. As we followed the path of the river, we began to encounter Indians who were also suffering from sickness. However, their sickness was not mountain fever, Father said. It was smallpox. To treat the disease, the Indians put the sick person in a teepee on the banks of the river. Hot rocks were placed all around and hot drinks given until a sweat was produced. Then the victim was plunged into the cold river. The treatment did not seem to be working as Indians were dying there by the dozens. One day, we found a nooning place on a flat, sandy bank of a river. I was wandering around chewing on a dry crust of bread when I saw John walk over to a deserted teepee. Curious, I followed him. Don't look, Mary Ellen, John warned, turning suddenly to block me from going in. But I had already glimpsed what was inside, a pile of dead Indians stacked up like logs, their hands and feet sticking out from a tattered buffalo robe. Oh, I cried dropping my bread in horror. Blindly, I ran for the wagon. Through the tall, stinging grass, I raced, tripping and stumbling. And then, what was lying in the grass right in front of me? It couldn't be, but it was another dead Indian. I was running so fast now, I couldn't stop. Without looking, I leapt over and kept going. A moment later, I was pulling myself up into our wagon. I took refuge in its dim, comforting interior. My legs were trembling and my breath came in long, rabbit, ragged gasps. My heart was fluttering like a frightened bird. Are you all right, Mary Ellen? Mother's face, pale and concerned, appeared at the opening in the window in the wagon cover. I nodded, not able to speak. Why don't you stay inside and work on your quilt pieces for a little while, she suggested. All right, I whispered. 
and there I stayed for the rest of the afternoon. Some of the sick children were beginning to improve, but now Mrs. Clark had come down with a fever. I missed her bustling presence and her cheerful, encouraging voice around the cooking fires. Still, we kept moving as fast as we could. Then one morning I woke up with the chills. My body ached all over and I couldn't get out of bed. Mother felt my forehead. It is the fever, she said. Father gave me some medicine, but instead of feeling better, I felt even worse. All that day, I huddled underneath my quilt on my feather bed, some, sometimes shivering, other times burning hot, while the wagon jolted along over steep, rough, rocky roads. In the kind of feverish dream, I listened to the murmur of the wagon wheels. Now they did not say going to Oregon or even chuggity chug, chuggity chug. They didn't say anything at all. I kept wanting to cry out to them, stop, let me rest. But even in my dream, I knew we could not stop. In the evening, mother brought me a little gruel with cream in it. Looking at the bowl, I shook my head. Take just a little, she urged me, it will make you stronger. I made myself take a bite, but it didn't taste good. Weakly, I pushed the spoon away. The next few days went by in a haze. I slept and woke, took a sip of water or ate a few bites, then slept again. Mother's blurred face came and went, her eyes looking anxious, urging me to eat. Father often sat next to me, holding my hand in his big warm one. One morning, smiling, he told me that I had kept everyone awake in the night with my singing, though I did not remember it at all. He also said I was not as sick as Mrs. Clark and some of the others. But I did not want to get out of the wagon or even look out of the opening at the blinding brightness of the sky. At night I had dreams, terrible confusing visions of wolves and wagons lying in broken pieces, oxen that kept walking even though they were only a strung together collection of white bones and dead Indians stacked up in piles. Once I dreamed that a young Indian with the glittering black eyes was throwing his lasso at me. The rope was closing around my neck. I kept screaming and trying to get into the wagon, but some, somehow its sides had suddenly grown as tall and steep as a cliff, so tall and steep I could not climb them. Mary Ellen! My eyes opened to find father bending over me. The Indian, I, mummer, mummer, I mumbled fearfully, not sure if I was asleep or awake. He had a rope, he was trying to get me. No one is after you, honey, he reassured me. You are safe here with mother and father. Don't cry now. Father gave me a drink of water and bathed my face and hands with a cool cloth. Then very gently, he stroked my hair, humming under his breath, oh, happy day. His voice was so soothing and his touch so soft. Surely, I thought, my eyes beginning to close, my father must be the best man in the whole world. The image of that Indian's eyes slowly faded away and I drifted off to sleep again.